What's worse than being attacked by a grizzly bear? Being attacked by a grizzly bear twice. June 20th, 2010. It was a mild 59 degrees in June in Southern Alaska. In a remote area near Rainy Pass Iditarod, 54-year-old Robert Miller was finishing up for the day and getting ready to head home. He worked as a geologist for Millrock Resources and had been scouting the area for potential metallic mineral deposits. Robert's helicopter was already on its way to collect him. All he had to do now was clear a landing site for the pilot and radio through his exact location. The regional landscape consisted of a mixture of tundra, spruce forests, rivers, and open sea. It's an area that is famed for its wilderness and breathtaking beauty. There are approximately 60,000 grizzly bears living wild in North America. 30,000 of them are found in Alaska. Robert knew he was in bear country, and he had received training prior to beginning his field work should he encounter a bear. He began clearing some brush with a handsaw in preparation for the arrival of the helicopter. His bag was down on the ground, and his back was to the deepest part of the forest. His radio was slotted into his shirt pocket, his 357 Magnum at hand. Midway through clearing the area, Robert heard a noise. He turned around just in time to see a grizzly bear emerge from the undergrowth. Robert was taken by surprise. He had no idea that he had been working in such close proximity to the animal. It stood barely 25 feet away. The bear gave Robert little time to think and little time to act. It came for him. Robert thought that it was a mock charge, as is often the case. However, he was shocked when the bear followed through with the attack. It hadn't growled at Robert or stood on its hind legs in a show of power. Instead, it ran at him straight away. Robert immediately pulled out his 357 Magnum and squeezed the trigger. In the panic, he barely grazed the animal, and realizing the animal wasn't going to stop, Robert flung himself onto the ground. He lay on his stomach and interlocked his fingers behind his neck. He buried his face in the dirt and braced himself for the attack. He had been trained to do this in such an event. He knew that he needed to protect his neck as best as he could, as bears often bite their prey at the back of the neck and head to immobilize it. In less than 15 seconds, the bear had shredded Robert's elbow to the bone. But the attack was over almost as quickly as it had begun. Robert saw the beast lumbering away and breathed a sigh of relief. He lay there for a moment, checking himself over before getting to his knees. Some male grizzlies can grow up to eight feet long and weigh over 700 pounds. They can smell food from up to a mile away, and their jaws are powerful enough to crush a human skull. They are territorial and can be hostile to intruders. Females are very protective of their cubs and can be aggressive near a carcass they claim as their own. Robert grimaced with the pain in his right arm and was shocked to see the deep wound. As he began to stand up, he glanced to his side, and to his horror, the bear was coming at him again. Robert couldn't believe it and lifted his gun once more. The bear was only 40 yards away. He fired off two more rounds. His injured arm was unsteady and shaking, and he missed the bear entirely. He planted himself firmly into the ground again. Face down, he braced for another beating. As the bear mauled Robert again and again, he managed to play dead. The bear thrashed Robert around. Its brute force tossed him like a rag doll. He felt no pain at that point and just kept focused on keeping his body face down and protecting the back of his neck. The bear gnawed and chewed. Robert's left ear was nearly ripped clean off and his right thigh was sliced deeply by the bear's claws. The pressure of the bites and the ferociousness of the attack were incredible, and yet Robert remained lying there, clinging on to the hope that the bear would once again stop its attack and leave him. His hopes were answered as the bear, for a second time, left him. It snorted and wandered off into the trees. Robert dared not move. He hardly breathed, listening to any signs of the bear. He lay there deadly still, not making a sound. His mind raced. Should he lift his head and check for the bear? Should he remain face down and risk the bear coming back for more? Where was his gun? 
How badly was he bleeding? The gun had been knocked out of Robert's hand during the attack. He calmed his breathing, taking one deep breath at a time. Then, very slowly, he moved his head to one side. Still lying there, he looked all around. Nothing. Then, very slowly, he turned his head to the other side and searched for the bear. There was no sign of his attacker. Carefully, Robert tried to stand up. He couldn't. He was too badly injured. He managed to roll over onto his back. Gasping in pain, Robert felt in his pocket. He pulled out his radio. Lifting it to his mouth, he made a desperate mayday call. The radio crackled and then there was silence. Robert tried again and again. Every 20 seconds or so, he made a mayday call, but to his dismay, no one answered. He knew he needed help urgently, but there was no way that he could move. Whilst contemplating his predicament, he suddenly heard the radio crackling to life. It was the helicopter pilot. He wasn't responding to Robert's mayday. Instead, he was calling to find out Robert's exact location so that he could collect him. When Robert told him what had happened, the pilot flew in low and circled the area. Combing the forest in outwardly expanding circles, the pilot was satisfied that the bear had disappeared and went to collect a field medic from the next valley over. Robert breathed a sigh of relief when the helicopter landed yards from him and the wilderness medic, Ryan Campbell, stepped off. He ran over to Robert and assessed his injuries. He was bleeding badly and had large gaping wounds. As Ryan began cleaning the wounds and applying pressure bandages, Robert grimaced in pain. The pain was immense. Robert described it like a mixture of fire and electricity. Ryan and the pilot lifted Robert into the chopper and lay him down. They flew into a nearby airstrip and radioed ahead. An emergency medic was waiting for them, who then flew Robert to the hospital in Anchorage. It was an agonizing hour-long flight, and Robert gritted his teeth, trying desperately to stay awake. He kept recalling the attack over and over in his head, wondering where he had gone wrong. Could he have done things differently? In the hospital, Robert underwent surgery to fix his open wounds. He was lucky to be alive. He had survived by playing dead. His face suffered nothing but a few scratches. Lying face down and protecting the back of his neck had saved him. He should have taken a bigger caliber gun with him, but even then, he had such little time to react that he still may not have hit the bear. Robert says he doesn't hold a grudge against the animal. He knew that he was in bear territory, and he knew the risks. His training and quick thinking were vital to his survival. Rick Sinat, a biologist from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, said that Robert did the right thing by playing dead. He said most bears just want to neutralize the threat. If you're shouting and screaming and waving your arms around, they're going to keep attacking you. But if you remain still and silent, then the threat has been neutralized. The second time around, Robert had been neutralized.